Good evening. Um, welcome to this, our third round table for 2023, um, which will be looking at artisanal mining, um, gold mining uh, especially, and uh, looking at these issues in the context of, of South Africa and the challenges um, that this presents and the absence of a uh, regulatory um, and policy framework that is adequate. I wanted to say a big thank you to all of you um, for coming this evening. And with that, an apology for arrangements which may have seemed a little furtive and um, secretive. Um, that has been due in um, some measure uh, owing to uh, necessity. Um, that flows from the work that we have been doing, which uh, many of you will be familiar with, uh, which relates to our challenge uh, to the Department of Home Affairs and the Minister of Home Affairs' decision to um, terminate the Zimbabwe exemption permits, um, which will, um, if that happens, essentially result in the forcible expulsion um, and rendering uh, of around 180,000 uh, Zimbabwean nationals who have lived in South Africa perfectly legally for the past 14 years will render them uh, undocument, undocumented uh, with all the vulnerability that attaches to that status. We challenged uh, that decision on the basis that there had been no consultation uh, with those who were going to be adversely affected by the, the decision whatsoever, that there was no sound reason for having made this decision and that there was no fair process um, that was offered to them. Um, in a judgment we received earlier this year, um, uh, we obtained a, a favorable verdict on all scores, um, on all those issues. Um, the minister is now appealing uh, that judgment, but it has placed us in the crosshairs of uh, some rather shadowy organizations who insist that um, migrants are the cause of all of South Africa's ills um, and that it is not a case of rather woeful governance failures. Uh, what that has meant is um, that this event tonight has uh, received some unpleasant attention and uh, there was a suggestion made that uh, we were looking to advocate for Zama Zamas uh, and uh, uh, some threats uh, of disruption. Um, those have not come to pass and, and, and will not. Um, we've made sure of that. Um, but it does make this event uh, that much more important. Um, uh, there is a rich irony that an organization that calls itself uh, Put South Africa First would look to shut down an event of this nature, right? That you, you would stop rich, engaging, deliberative discussion in the face of really challenging and complex problems. Um, and rather than engage in a thoughtful manner, uh, one would simply look to insist that uh, some scapegoat um, is responsible. So thank you so much for your support, for the courage uh, in being here uh, tonight. We are um, enormously grateful. Um, and let me say a big thank you to our um, panelists for being here. Um, this was prompted by, um, and if you haven't read it, I'm sure most of you have, um, Kimon de Grief, who is a freelance journalist. His piece uh, in the New Yorker earlier this year um, on the stranglehold that illegal mining has on the, the mining town of, of Valcom uh, and the extent to which that economy, to the extent that it is existence, is, is basically supported by illegal uh, mining activity. It is a gripping, riveting account, but it is also prompting of really rich um, thought and discussion. Uh, I hope uh, it certainly, I, I think, prompts that. Um, it is a masterclass in long-form journalism. Um, we're really delighted that he is here uh, tonight, um, delighted to have um, Dr. Janet um, want to come we're here. She is a, a pan-African activist and a scholar 
and has been um, also, I should say, an amazing friend to the HSF um, at a time when we have been receiving, uh, as I've already indicated, some rather unpleasant attention. So thank you, Janet, for all you've done and the solidarity you've shown us. Um, and then really delighted uh, to have uh, Professor Keith Breckenridge, who is uh, the Standard Bank Chair in Trust Infrastructure at WISER, which um, is um, at Wits University, many of you will know, um, really a hugely impressive institute producing um, you know, deep, uh, rich scholarship. Um, he, um, his experience, uh, expertise, particularly um, in respect of gold mining, I think is going to make, and I know he's, doing, he's been doing some scholarship on Zamazama activity um, <clears throat> in, in Africa um, broadly. I think that's gonna make for a really fabulous discussion. Uh, and then lastly, um, Kamira Chetty, who is um, an associate director of Africa Practice, which is a risk consultancy. She's head of policy, and then if I can say, at least for our sake, most importantly, uh, a, a great friend um, and a, a previous a researcher at the Helen Sussman Foundation. And so we're really delighted to have her this evening to facilitate uh, the, the discussion. Um, before I hand over to Kimira to uh, initiate the discussion, I'm just going to call on um, Inga Herbert, who is the uh, regional head of the Friedrich Nauman Foundation. Um, they are our partners for tonight's event. Um, they've also uh, been exceptional friends uh, and supporters of ours, um, and it has been a joy to, to work with them. So Inga, can I ask you to come up? Thank you, Nicole. Uh, just a short welcome, welcome on behalf of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. So Nicole has already mentioned um, the preparations of this event. So um, originally we wanted to host this event at our new premises in Parkview, quite visible there on the corner of Ennis Road and Tyrone. And uh, but I'm very, um, I'm very confident that we will be able to have a lot of other events there. We manage it quite well. Uh, the risk today. Um, yeah, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. We are a German political foundation for political education. Um, one of our aims is also to be more of a think tank, to encourage thinking, and this is why we partner with organizations like the Helen Sussman Foundation. Um, yeah, we are very grateful that, uh, that the Holocaust Center could, could, um, could offer this, their venue today for, for this event. Um, but yeah, what we think and what we want to do, we want to um, have all this research and, and the thinking out to a larger audience and this is why we won't give up to host events and to communicate and, and, and to see that we can reach all this for a larger audience because it's, it's really important that, that more than the converted are actually fighting for, for rule of law and, and democracy in this country and beyond. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the discussion. enough? Great. Um, so how to solve a problem like illegal mining? Well, we might not get to the answers in today's conversation, but a place we, we hope to land is to speak to some of the dynamics. Nicole has touched on some of them. They're multifaceted to say the least. Uh, the topic for tonight speaks about a regulatory framework that's absent in the context of South Africa, but behind that framework are human stories uh, Kimon's piece, which I've, I hope most of us have had the chance to read, and if not, definitely set aside the time for it. It, it is a masterclass, like Nicole says, is a story of those involved, whether we're speaking about artisanal miners, illegal miners, Zamazamas as we've come to know them, um, but also the communities in which uh, these miners are both a part of, um, and a part of maybe symbolically, as in a part of but not integrated into, but also the communities themselves who are impacted by the criminal elements that surround this activity. Um, this is a question that has vexed private public sectors, uh, actors alike, as well as communities about what is the right way to have this conversation. And I have no doubt in today's, in, in tonight's conversation, we'll get to touch some of the complexity about all of these different elements. Um, we've heard, for example, comments from um, the Gauteng Premier, Premier Le Sufi, saying that the province is under siege. 
uh, by these miners, uh, the Department of Mineral Resources estimating that as of 2019, both the mining sector and the South African economy have lost 49 billion rand already. Those are big numbers and they're scary to hear. Um, but what we're missing maybe from the conversation, including from government side, is what does this mean and, and unpacking what is behind those numbers and what are the enabling factors and some of the incentives. We've seen pr promises from President Ramaphosa to start addressing this gap from a policy point of view. Um, unfortunately, some of the, the efforts have been prioritized from a law enforcement perspective. Um, comments from standoff saying we need to flush out uh, these miners, and not just from abandoned mines, but from communities themselves. And that begs the question, how do you identify who you're trying to flush out? Maybe more problematically, and Nicole has alluded to this, we've seen um, what is a, you know, the narrative swirl around a very serious and deep problem being conflated with xenophobic creep dog whistles around migrant presence in our communities, and what are our communities, um, and these are all elements that factor deeply uh, in this conversation. So we're really lucky to be joined today by this esteemed panel. I think for most of us, we're on the periphery of this conversation, deeply fascinated by it because it is quite seedy and, you know, it, it's wild when you read some of the dynamics, but our panel tonight have been on closer, you know, more sort of involved in their various ways in, in addressing the problem, whether by just taking us on the inside and taking us into the human stories. Um, Kimon, I'd like to start with you, and just for the sake of our program tonight, each of our panelists will give a five-minute um, intro into the work they do and their proximity to this issue, and then we'll go into a, a conversation thereafter. We'll definitely have time for questions and comments from the panel. Well, Kimon, you're no stranger to taking your reader into these underworlds of illicit trade. In 2018, you wrote your book, Poacher, which looks at the illicit abalone trade. Um, but you're quite careful to not employ sort of a value judgment. Uh, and you've, you've said in interviews, you don't seek to do an expose, but you're here to show sort of a, a human narrative and a human uh, tale in your biographical approach. I'm interested if you could take us through what it takes just to sort of gain the trust of getting into that side of the conversation and being taken into, um, again, the trust of being a, an observer who's there to, to relay your story and maybe what it's unearthed for you in, in seeing that side of gold mining. I just spilled water all over myself. Hi. <laughs> um, this is the first public event I've done in some time. I'm working on another book and I've been a hermit. And uh, as a little hobby, I grew this mustache, um, which has, uh, over the years, a very f recurring um, charge from sources to me is that I'm an undercover cop. That's what mm -hmm. people <laughs> think I am. So now I've been telling them, like, you know, I've been with the Bureau for so long that they made me grow the, the snort. Um, anyway, so it's, it's wonderful to be here and, like, talk about a project that lasted for uh, many years uh, and acutely for more than one year. Uh, I am interested in illicit trades. I have been for a long time. I think that they're super interesting. They offer super interesting lenses onto the past and the present. Um, there's, you can read the economy, you can read history, you can read exclusion, you can read politics. Um, so Abalone was the, the, the gateway uh, trade for me, but since then I've, I've been uh, that's kind of the track I've gone on as a reporter. I've been doing this for about a decade. Um, gold always felt like a big, difficult story. Um, and one that I started trying to report in 2016. I remember going, walking around Cape Town CBD to the street corners where undocumented Zimbabwean men would aggregate, like waiting for someone to come with a truck to pick them up so they could go and, you know, do casual labor for 100 grand a day. And I spent days hanging around these places and introducing myself and saying, I want to do this story. And I ended up meeting a guy. Um, so to your question, how? Um, the first thing is I've, I've developed quite a high tolerance for like being an embarrassing person. Because people, <laughs> it's, like, it's quite awkward to walk up to a bunch of people who have reason to be suspicious of an outsider asking questions. Um, but I'm also just genuinely interested in what, it means to strap on a scuba rig and 
dive off a boat at midnight in kelpie waters where there's sharks and spend the next two hours digging around for shellfish or climb down into a deserted mine shaft, which we can talk more about later. Um, and I think that people are quite a good read of intention, and my intention's normally like, I just, I really want to hear what it's like. Um, so I met a Zimbabwean guy on this corner after being laughed at for like a day, and um, he started talking about his experiences, and he started talking about Welcome, which was uh, something I saw in Welcome, you know, Matt's, but mm. I knew nothing about Welcome. I knew nothing about the history of Welcome. Uh, I started trying to pitch a story. The way freelance journalists work, I don't have an employer. Uh, I have to come up with an idea and then sort of shop it around and persuade someone else that it's a good idea. And uh, in 2017, I did that without success, basically, and 2018 as well. Wanting to go there, I read some reports that there were 5,000 men living under underground, mm. um, that the tunnels were one to two kilometers deep. I spoke to a mine rescuer who told me about finding bodies that had fallen down these shafts, which I then went online. You can get like a gravity velocity calculator and just, you know, so I was like, how long would it take to fall that far? And it's like 15 to 20 seconds. Um, and he described the, 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 the wreckage of human remains that they would pull up from the bottom of these shafts. And that kind of haunted me. Um, I, I still can't think of anything more unimaginable then, uh, and, and maybe we'll talk more about that later. I don't want to use up too much time, but going down into this like labyrinth of collapsed and dark and unventilated mm -hmm. tunnels. It's like a, I've spent years talking to abalone poachers. I thought what they did was unimaginably terrifying. And I've told a few of them, I was like, guys, this is actually makes you look like, <laughs> this is even more hardcore. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about the hardcore, the, the shock, the horror. It's also, I think, to tell a complicated story, people need a, a person to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I left South Africa for a couple of years. I came back, and Julian Rademey is actually here. He's from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. And uh, he, I asked him if I could do some work on mining. And thank you, Julian, because they sent me up to, to Velcom. And I did a report, um, a sort of criminological report, and met a few people, and then when I was in Valcom, there was a guy that everyone spoke about. They said his name was One Eye. That was like literally his name. And I said, tell me more about One Eye. And um, the more I heard about him, the more I began to think that there was a, a narrative version of some of the research work that I've been doing, uh, a story with a person to focus on, and the, the briefest synopsis I can tell is that One Eye was an undocumented Mozambican man who came here either in his childhood or in his teens, the accounts differ, but was being arrested in slip slops, torn jeans, and a dirty t-shirt in the 1990s at G Hostel, which is this like apartheid era migrant hostel that had been sort of taken over and become a sort of zama zama gold smelting hub. And uh, through, you know, uh, the, the, the opportunities that are available to men like that are like quite minimal. And he grabbed what, he, what was available to him and uh, earned money going down into the mines, lived underground for six months, um, reinvested his money back into the economy, established himself as a gold buyer, and more importantly, a provider of food. Because when you go underground, you need to get food down there, and that's actually enormously complicated to get <laughs> 5,000 people's worth of meals two kilometers under the earth. And he just made a hell of a lot of money and became so powerful that uh, ESCOM was threatening to cut off the municipal account, cut off all e electricity to uh, Velcom, to the Machabeng municipality a few years ago. They had the largest unpaid bill in the country. And there was this rumor that One Eye had made a payment to vert the power cuts. And I kind of thought that was taking it a bit far. But like the, he was the executive mayor of Velcom. That was what people told, told him as well. He had station commanders in his pocket. Uh, he just controlled everything. Um, magistrates, attorneys, police, traffic cops. Um, he was the biggest 
patron of uh, one particular KFC, because KFC is like a thing that miners get as a treat underground. <laughs> uh, costs like 5,000 Rand sometimes mm. for a bucket of mm. KFC. Mm. And uh, they would send cars and pick up like 80 KFC buckets at once from this one KFC. And then all the other customers would complain because they'd wait forever <laughs> for their food. Because they'd like, when do you go to KFC? And it's like, sorry, we've just got like 80 <laughs> buckets to make. Um, but I thought the cash payment was a, uh, an exaggeration until I went to his second mm. murder trial because he, he had a downfall. He, he, he had too many of his rivals whacked and then was eventually picked up. And at his second murder trial, I met him. And um, I asked him, is it true? I heard that you paid this thing and he beamed at me. He denied being a gold smuggler, but he smiled at me. He said, yeah, it was 15 million rand. And he looked so proud of himself. And um, I don't know if there's anything that like encapsulates the weirdness of an illicit economy that like this guy was at once like the most ruthless person who like had probably like a dozen people or more killed and then profited off the labor of these guys who go and mm. live in the tunnels and almost die, but also kept this ailing economy of this <laughs> abandoned, totally screwed up gold town running. Um, it's a complex set of forces mm -hmm. that give rise to somebody like that, and I think he was a useful person to explore this gold economy through. Um, I just got a message from his right-hand man, because I sent him a copy of the magazine, and he said the magazine's now in prison with one eye, but I haven't heard what he thinks of it. I was hoping to get feedback. Anyway, I've spoken too long. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question. But no, thank you, Kimon. If it, if it <laughs> was not for people with your unrelenting sense of curiosity in this world, uh, we would not know about a KFC in Belcom hmm. where you've spent hmm. 5,000 rand on a bucket. That's right. So I mean, how crazy it is that? It pays off to be, yeah, to be very crazy. irritating to people, and thank you for your piece. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> but um, Dr. Munakami, I want to turn to you. A lot of what Kimon's just walked us through is it's harrowing, to say the least, what someone might subject themselves to um, for an economic opportunity. And in listening, in listening to what some of those motivations might be, your work explores the economic activity of illegal and informal mining, but particularly through a gendered lens. Um, and, and Kimon, there are a lot of big men in your piece, uh, reservists, associates. Um, but Dr. Munakamwe, I'm interested, you know, the gendered lens you approach also looks at this subject of criminalization but particularly as it impacts migrant women and children um, who are also seeking economic e opportunity in this sector. And we'd love for you to talk us through what your work has revealed in, um, in these conversations. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, a very good evening to you all. Um, where I normally also speak, I always say revolutionary greetings. Um, hopefully it won't stimulate a lot of, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, thank you so much uh, to the HSF for organizing this particular platform for us. And of course, um, FNF for supporting and everybody who made it tonight. Uh, there's this particular reason why I want to emphasize that. I'm going to try and touch from the opening remarks by um, uh, Nicole, then... I'll just touch on uh, some of the provocative uh, issues that he has raised in my response to my specific question. I'm sorry if I'm going to take a lot of time, uh, but please uh, forgive me. I'm the only lady here <laughs> on the panel. <laughs> Don't punish me when I take too long. No, it's okay. So yeah, talking about criminalization, I think uh, I'm so glad that in my opening remarks, Nicole gave us a brief overview of the regularization processes that have happened in South Africa in a bid to try and um, regularize migrants in South Africa. And I guess um, the young man you interacted with hopefully is regularized or perhaps he benefited from the um, I'll tell other. You, I'll tell you about yes, it. Yes, yeah. I think <laughs> I'm just picking up from your hands. I said I'm going to touch on some of the uh, provocative issues that have been raised. So basically what it means is that um, I've been working um, in abandoned mines in the western, western area in Johannesburg for almost four, uh, you know, almost 10 years now. Um, my interest actually, um, I was prompted much like you were uh, 
but by then it was really a sad story. 24 miners uh, from Zimbabwe, one from KZN, that's a local migrant, and one from Lesotho perished at one of the abandoned shafts. I think uh, it was all over the news. The news was awash with that particular case. It was like very outstanding, unlike what we are experiencing now. But that takes me to the question of the rule of law that uh, Inge has actually spoken about. So basically, uh, those people perished. Unfortunately, what was the first response? Nobody would want to report the case to the authorities or call for uh, assistance. Why? Because the bodies that are involved in that particular space have actually come up with their own coping mechanism to avoid any vigilance, you know, or maybe being noticed by authorities. I'm sure you came across it even in your own work. Um, the invisibility part of it. So they took some days trying to rescue, going underground, trying to rescue their own colleagues. But unfortunately, this time around, it wasn't so easy because uh, it was actually some flooding that had taken place. Uh, and those who decided perhaps to go underground, they couldn't sustain because there were lots of um, toxic um, substances and um, air that was underground. So they couldn't make it. That's the point at which they had to call for formal, you know, you know, there's um, authorities to come on board and assist. So what intrigued me, it's not because of the Zimbabwean story or the, the Zimbabweans that were actually involved there. Um, of course, I've been working in that particular area on mining. When I started my PhD, I selected the mining sector simply because of the, its connections to the labor migration system mm -hmm. under apartheid. So going in there was just from a human rights perspective. Um, Ubuntu, um, I've, I had all the, the years been this particular incident. I didn't know who, which bodies had been recovered and for who. Because in my work as a Pan-African feminist scholar, I'm actually nationally blind. If a local person is in trouble, I will have to go and do, you know, the kind of interventions that I can. Um, and that takes us back to the point uh, of the criminalization part of it. So unfortunately, the bodies that were discovered, many of them did not have paperwork for clearance, even with the Zimbabwean embassy itself or the local authorities. But most importantly, the case that in the local Zamazama also didn't have, didn't have documentation. Mm. They actually struggled <laughs> to locate his relatives back home. So this is a point that I want to pin down, that um, of course, uh, for us or for me to be part of and friend to the HSF, like Nicole alluded to, it's based on that Pan-African solidarity spirit that says, when they came for this, you ignored because we are not that. When they came for the Jews, you ignored because we are not a Jew. When they came for, you know, whoever. So in that particular m moment, I think what was critical for me was that um, it was actually a wake-up call for all the um, NGOs, you know, human rights organizations that were on that space, um, that it's not only migrants, cross-border migrants, that do not have documentation. That was one. But it's also local. And in the case that if that particular individual were to be nabbed by police, you know, they do their raids, it simply means he was going to also get into the same prison and if not deported, we have heard of uh, cases where local South Africans are deported simply because of how they look. Hmm. They look more Zimbabwean than they can be deported wherever, where, you know, those subjectivities. So this one point about criminalization of that sector. 
So basically, the bodies that are involved in there are, criminal, are doubly criminalized for me, in the sense that in some cases, they don't have the, um, they're not documented, not because they don't want, but because of the restrictive immigration laws, which we actually um, refer to as institutionalized xenophobia, because like um, Kiman has uh, actually alluded to earlier, um, for every struggle, there should be a lawyer, activist, and a storyteller. This is something that I borrowed from the Daily Maverick. <laughs> Very intriguing and profound article that was shared last week. So basically, um, uh, the people in this particular case shared their narratives. They shared their stories because obviously people might say, where are those individuals we are talking about? We are actually caring and trying to now share the stories in a way, even though uh, some people would argue that they would, should be in the room to say it for themselves, but there is obviously a chance for them to uh, have that particular opportunity. So they shared their very, very um, disturbing um, stories around gross human violations by police. But what was important for me were two issues. The issue of we don't want to be undocumented. One, we would want to also contribute towards tax. Those 5,000 KFCs, they should be going if they would really uh, uh, allow them to. But unfortunately, I met engineers in that space, qualified engineers, mining engineers. Anyone who has ever bothered to, who has ever wondered who actually um, direct as to where there is gold or, or whatever in those spaces. Mm. So, these are critical skills that South Africa actually has listed on their critical skills list. But what, what, are, the bureau, what are the barriers, the bureaucracies, obviously, uh, in which we find um, some dubious conditions? I think the HSF perhaps would have a closer look into that. Uh, barriers, you know, restrictive barriers such as professional body. For one to even get registered with a professional body, it's a mission. Two, uh, there's the issue of Department of Labor, you know, benchmarking. Then the institutionalized xenophobia across all the departments that these particular people have to work with. I think recently there's been a case even with locals that are finding even it difficult to even get an ID. Like for example, uh, the second um, generation of migrants from countries like Mozambique, whose perhaps fathers were working in the mines, that intergenerational uh, uh, aspect of mining um, in which the sons also want to come back and work in the mines and their parents were granted some amnesty in 1996, but still it becomes a problem. Perhaps there's the DNA test and all those kind of things. So yeah, those are some of the uh, issues that I would really want to put on the table. But the second part of criminalization is that which is within the DMRA, <coughs> the DMR, uh, the aspect of the bodies that are actually involved in extracting what they call precious minerals. They don't have a problem if I go out with my hoe and go and dig uh, <laughs> clay there. Nobody cares, you know? Even if I'm saying I'm going to look for mice, they don't care. But they care about the outcome. The moment I come up with a small pebble, precious one, then I'm criminalized straight away. So you can actually see the reason why I had to provide this kind of narrative that goes round and round is just to try and put us into the picture um, as to what exactly is at hand, what do we mean by criminalization, and why do we need a regulatory framework? Um, it's not only South Africa that is uh, facing that quagmire. Last month in August, we were at the SADC People's Summit where we hosted um, a seminar session because they said they've never experienced that before, they've never had such a session, 
on ASM, and of course it was very thought-provoking, but obviously something that, you know, the powers that be are not very comfortable with us discussing. Why? Because there is all this hype around new minerals, the transition minerals for climate justice, climate change, lithium, who is taking that lithium? So it's not a very easy story like what uh, Kimani has alluded to, to say or to talk about. But this is part of the work that we have been trying to, you know, raise mm -hmm. from a policy perspective because the scapegoat is always like, oh, there's no regulatory framework. So even, I think those who are arrested, uh, my colleagues will tell me from the work that if they've been doing also, there's no specific laws to prosecute them. So it's either you pay a bribe, that 5,000 KFC, <laughs> or you have, they have to invoke certain particular laws, like for example, when they find you now with a large chunk of money, you are actually prosecuted under the money laundering laws. So, outside of everything else, and one would wonder as to who are the worst looters and money launderers, obviously the ruling elite. They can keep thousands, millions in, under their pillows in their homes, but if myself as Janet am found with large, even if it belongs to me, I've worked hard underground because I don't even know, I'm just now talking like the, at the Zamazama, I don't even know when I go down whether I'm gonna come back. And now when I have to also enjoy the little that I've managed to um, extract, I become criminalized simply because those spaces actually are ring fenced for certain particular individuals. So that talks about the rule of law, um, Inge. The rule of law is not that today, that's when we are beginning to see people attacking human rights defenders like Nicole and HSF team. Or Siri, we know lawyers for human rights, everyone who has been trying to champion um, you know, rights for those who are actually like in the marginal, in the periphery, are always criminalized or attacked or so forth. It has been happening in those abandoned shops where police would actually um, brutalize human beings simply because you are coming out, you are dirty with you or whatever, you are a criminal. Even if you haven't committed anything that constitutes a crime. So, how many times have people reported around those issues? Human rights defenders have been reporting those cases. Nobody cares because um, these individuals, most of them are coming from across the board bodies. So they are not human. They don't have human, they don't have rights according to whoever. That's why people just, I mean, I don't mean they don't have, but in courts, there we don't care even if police brutalize and beat them up to death. We don't care. We have, I came across very graphic stories um, where there's impunity. As long as you, are, you kill a Zamazama, there's no problem. So I think I'll share one of my articles that was loaded more. Um, you know, I came to a super saturation point whereby everyone that I interview, I speak to, whether women, they will talk about police brutality first as their main concern that they would really need the media or whoever cared to intervene, the lawyers, whoever cared to intervene. So the rule of law in a constitutional democracy is one of the key issues that we need to take note of that it didn't start like today or last year or this year when mm. they start targeting you know, activists or, you know, human rights, it has been happening. And we certainly need to have more and more of these seminars. Uh, and of course, political education. For those who do not understand why people are risking their lives, they don't even enjoy going underground and spending six months, some up to six months and uh, like two, Kimani. Two by, years. Yes, by then, the time I went, I also like almost was tempted to go underground, but I won't tell you why. <laughs> I will talk about it later. 
the bread, a loaf of bread was claimed to be selling at 1,000 rand. Mm. A bottle of water, 500. These are the realities. And I won't get much into the other issues for now. I think I have said the women part of it, we all know that all women are exposed to gender-based violence. And it's even worse for migrant women, because of that double criminalization, um, many suffer silently or even die. Mm -hmm. Sexually harassed, violated, but at the end of the day, they can't go and open up cases. The more they went, they even go anywhere near, then they're locked up simply because they don't have the and they are involved in illegal activities. So I won't get deeper into that. Perhaps I'll leave it for now. Until thank you, thank you Dr. Minakama. So and I think you've thank you. taken us quite a bit already into some food for thought when we get into our discussion. Mm. And I've made a note of, of things to come back to that I'd also like him on and, and Prof to respond to. But Prof, I'm going to turn to you. A lot thank of your work um, has offered an economic history of the special place of mining, as you call it, in African economies. And in the past, you've employed a multifaceted lens both from a political economy point of view, but you've also explored important questions of race, masculinity, power dynamics um, in understanding the machinations of the sector. Both Dr. Munakamwe and Kimon have spoken about the question of trust. Um, and from a, a social lens, trust forms a part of this conversation, whether between citizens and their states, or the financial institutions of their states, the question of what motivates one to cross a border uh, and seek an economic opportunity in gold mining. How important is this question of trust in this conversation and, and what has your work yeah, revealed at some of this? Thank you, that's very kind of you to accommodate my, my obsession and thanks very much for, the, for HSFT for the invitation. Nice to be here with Kimon and Janet. Um, I think that the, this problem is actually all about trust and it's about the uh, trust infrastructures, or, or perhaps a better way of thinking about it, this is to go back to Keynes's old arguments from 100 years ago in which he said, lecturing, especially the advocates of the gold standard, I wasn't there, um, none of us were there, uh, but he said, you know, you, you, you people are kind of, you have a kind of barbarian's view of what value is, and you think that you can rely on gold because you don't trust the experts who make decisions. You don't trust the decision makers. You don't trust your institutions. Uh, and what's driving the, this problem of artisanal gold mining, it's actually, the gold mining side of artisanal mining is relatively recent, I think. The explosive gro growth is this comprehensive collapse of trust in financial institutions, especially in the global south, right? I hate that word, I hate that, that <laughs> phrase, because there's really nothing. We don't share anything with Kazakhstan and Turkey, except this, this thing that we don't trust our governments. Um, uh, and which means we, people, they, they've turned to gold really kind of fanatically. So just to give a sense, I'm not sure what the policy takeaway is, mm -hmm. but this problem is a much bigger problem than a, the South African problem. So the, the government estimate we have 16,000 artisanal miners, probably wrong by a factor of three, probably we have 50, 60,000, but it's not much more than that. Gold mining has always been very difficult in South Africa. It's really dangerous. You cannot just dig a hole. You have to go down 3,000 feet, 4,000 feet, 5,000 feet, and the earth is likely to kill you while you're down there. You know, it's very, it commonly moves and kills people underground. So no one is doing this um, as the first choice, as a survivalist strategy. They're doing it because they're desperate, and there are relatively few of them. Zimbabwe, we have 50,000. The, the best estimates are for a million and a half artisanal gold miners in Zimbabwe, a million in DRC, a million in each of the Sahel countries, right? So Sudan, Chad, Burkina Faso, Mali, Niger, that whole Sahel is basically being repurposed, reworked around surface artisanal entrepreneurship in which people dig for gold using metal detectors. So I can buy a metal detector and you know, find a response and start digging. And there's absolutely no question that it's changing how those 
all of those countries work. We get the model of artisanal mining, the formalization, we get it from Ghana. It comes from this guy Hilson's work. He's done a lot of work there saying Ghana can, you know, but the Ghanaians also have reached the point where essentially the demography means that the regulation is actually impossible, cannot be managed. They have 500,000 to a million people and it's starting to affect how agriculture works in Ghana. It's causing very obvious national political panic, much worse than ours, right? We worry about it off screen, the YouTube videos is where people look at it, it's not a big national crisis. Um, here, in, in these other countries, it's really existential, I think, is probably the best way to describe it. So let's put that question there and, uh, and, and we think about it. And the other thing about the important about this is these are kind of mo mobile frontiers, they move and they start on the, on the outskirts of states and they get more and more powerful um, as they draw in more and more people. Um, and they repurpose infrastructures, road systems, transport systems, political boundaries, firms, all of those things. So the real driver of this is demography on the one side. It's people without work, tens of millions of people without work. You can't, you can't expect that to be easily resolved. There's no easy policy to fix it. And then the flip side is, is the value of gold itself. So you know this, if you're my age, you can remember, right? You remember, they used to put the gold price, the SABC News, though, a guy would come on and tell you about you know, the ANC, the terrorist organization, and then they'd say, and the gold price is $333 an ounce, and you'd get the rand price, and that rand price was the measure of the viability of our economy. That's, that's how we, we thought about it, right? Gold has gone from Anglo-American killing price of $350 an ounce in 2001 mm. to $2,000 an ounce. So mm. seven-fold increase in the space of 20 years. And, and especially since 2008, the gold price has exploded, right? And we're not beneficiaries of this. We hardly export gold anymore. Ghana exports more gold than us, a lot of it from artisanal miners. Um, so the big driver actually is, got, is the price. But the other thing that we know, we know a lot, and the research is incredible. There are whole universities in Belgium, in, in Germany, in England, studying these gold fields. We know enormous amounts about them. We know, we, know, we are confident, mm -hmm. having done big randomized controls, our trials of the gold fields, we, we know people are earning four and a half dollars a day on average. That's what they, are, they, they, they basically earn from the little bits of grams of gold, at four and a half dollars, so something like 90 rand a day, 2,000 rand a month. And that means that the first thing you can be really confident about is we could solve this problem if we could spend 30 million rand a month and just give it to people and say, please don't mind, we'll give you money, go away. Of course, unfortunately, this is not an easy thing. As we know, we have a really big problem managing this kind of difficulty. So the price, that people get is the, really the determinant. So the famous story on, in African economic history is that African producers get virtually nothing of the global price for the commodity that they produce. So if you take cocoa, there's something, we don't know the exact numbers, but something like 20 million people produce cocoa on the African continent, and they have done for a century. They get about 2% of the global price of cocoa. The countries get about 6%. The rest goes to rich corporations, mm. mainly based in Switzerland and in, mm. the Bel in Belgium and the United States, right? the 94%. The there's a $100 billion cocoa economy, but the cocoa producers get nothing. Now, this is the really important fact. Gold miners get more than the metropolitan price. Not always, but usually. Right? So if I'm selling gold in Ghana or in Mali or in DRC or in Stilfontein, the dealer will pay me more than the London price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now that's the thing you really have to, so what that, what that reflects is this value chain above the producer, which is all about what gold as money can do, right? And what it can do, it can wash assets. Mm -hmm. You've got illegal assets. You've got illegal money that's come into your family for some reason. You don't want the government to know about it. You don't want, you know, whoever it is, the, the Barclays in London to know about it. So what do you do? You turn it into gold, you move the gold to Dubai, someone will deposit, deposit, put dollars in your Swiss bank account. It's very powerful. You can avoid tax, 
You can transfer money offshore, which is the real demand all of these families are looking for, how to get their money out of the country. So that value, that above the metropolitan price, is really the measure of institutional crisis, of the fact that people don't trust anyone in the system, they don't, and they're looking for monetary instruments that will allow them to get away, essentially, from the predicament that they, that they confront. I'm going to come back to Bretton Woods. I probably run out of time. I know. When you start talking, time stops. Yeah. All right, quickly, quickly, <laughs> quickly. Two more quick okay. points. Everywhere, this is intensely politicized, but it is especially intensely politicized in Zimbabwe. Right? It's become the fundamental source now of mm. power for ZANU-PF and for the mm. government institutions. Mm. Mm. So our policy, if we have one, I'm afraid, needs to work there. It doesn't really need to work here. It's got to fix what's happening in Zimbabwe if we expect not to have to deal with this problem here. And then the last quick point. There's a famous argument that these minerals are generating violence. You know, it's famous. It's one of the reasons why the American Congress introduced this, this kind of supply chain uh, surveillance and, and licensing. They said you can't put everything except cobalt. You can't use lithium in, a, in, a, in an iPhone unless you're confident it didn't come from some child slave mm. who's working in a mine. In Cong and so big American corporations all quickly went to check said to their dealers, don't buy from people who are sourcing their lithium in oh, Congo. But they didn't do it to co cobalt and they didn't do it to gold. And they still can't do it to gold. It's very difficult, mm. in fact, to kind of mm. generate because no one wants to be honest about where they got their gold from or who they're selling it to. So when this was being pushed in the US Congress, these very good researchers all over the continent were saying, oh, this is just rubbish. People are doing gold mining not because they want to fund political revolts, but because it's a, it's a way to work. I can earn $5 a day in, a, in an artisanal gold mine. If I work in a, in a cocoa field, my whole family is going to earn 80 cents. Mm -hmm. It's really an uncomplicated problem. Gold mining is there because it's better work. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the correlation between artisanal mining and the violence in Sahel, the violence in the DRC, and even the violence in Zimbabwe, mm. it's pretty clear. The bad guys come for the gold miners, mm -hmm. right? And it's really a high risk, politically high risk problem. This is existential. These coups are following essentially the expansion of the artisanal mining frontier. It's mm. it's not, I'm not, I know it sounds like I'm dramatizing this. It's a big political problem, this for us. It's not something we can easily walk away from. Um, yeah, and yeah, that's, let me stop there and people can make their kind of comments and criticism and see. Yeah. Thanks, Prof. Usually, usually on a panel, we have to try and find I ways know, what the good get, outcomes are. To get the panel to engage with each other. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think quite organically, um, each of the panelists have responded to and engaged. Come on, very quickly, I want to come back to you. Your article touches on a lot of these dynamics from the fact that Many of us might own a piece of jewelry that includes gold that was mined illegally and maybe we don't even know it, mm -hmm. but the question of how you source where the mineral came from in the first place is hard. But particularly on this point of, of price as the prime driver and incentive, um, all but going down the shaft yourself, you were very close to the motivations for, what, for the reasons why one might put themselves in such a precarious position. Um, and on the other side of that are enablers. Um, I think the panelists both have spoken to, there has to be a market that exists, right? There has to be a buyer. Um, unfortunately, the conversation about criminalization is very much focused on the miner and how to get mm. their activity right. Mm. In your experience, could you, could you tell us whether you came close to uncovering the dynamics of the other side the market. Yeah, sure. So, so there is a market. There's a huge market for gold, which is kind of preposterous in the sense that it's just yeah. valuable because people have decided it's valuable. Like, yeah. you know, mm. so it's this, this thing that we stuck with, which is like how the global economy became integrated was everyone joined the gold standard in like the 19th century. Um, and, and that demand remains and has risen because the gold price is higher now and dynamics around the Ukraine war we were talking before have actually like driven that way higher mm -hmm. recently. So gold is a thing that people want and covet. Um, on the other side, the motivations for climbing into a two kilometer deep fucking hole are absolute desperation. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's, it's an absolute mm -hmm. last resort industry. A lot of South Africans envy the money that Zamas make, but are not prepared to do that themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, in Volcom, the ways that people would get into pits 
would range from being lowered down by rope behind a reversing vehicle or uh, climbing down a rope ladder made with like rubber tires and ropes mm -hmm. or uh, climbing down the buntings, which are these like massive steel girders that used to hold these cages that would take the black and white mine workers down in a ratio mm -hmm. of like 15 to one to go toil underground and the, the cages have long ago been dismantled and now there's these massive girders and guys will slide down them, down two kilometers. And there's surveillance camera footage of uh, guys climbing down and then on the horizontal beams, these like corpses that have wrapped around mm. the girders because they've fallen 500 meters or whatever. So these are like, you know, desperation and market. And then there is a facilitator layer. There's an entire illicit economy that's kind of established as a mirror image of the legal economy. In a mm. way, there's security, there's mine security. Now mine security is mm. predominantly uh, Basutu gangsters wearing mm. color-coded Marashi blankets who seize control of the gold mines. And they're there because their forefathers were brought there by the you know, hundreds of thousands. Mm. Um, so that's the security layer. There's a food logistics layer who are like doing the catering, mm. which is in the past it was like, all the South African maize subsidies were trying to find ways to like cheaply get maize underground to give workers 4,000 calories a day because they were sweating in 50 degree heat or whatever. Mm. Now there's a food logistics line which is the David Wanais of the world going and shopping and buying all the loaves of bread in Valcom and flattening them so that they can get stuffed into the overalls of legal mine workers who are going mm. down that shaft and then scurrying it along down there mm. and then getting that huge markup that you spoke of. Um, and to this point of criminalization and brutality, they, you know, they, there's, a, there's a whole spectrum of participants. And Zama Zama mm. is like a kind of useless analytical word I've come to realize because David Wana is a Zama Zama, as is uh, a guy who I called Simon in the story. He's mm. a Zimbabwean dude who carried out 15 of his mates over a two week period when the Valcom security establishment managed to shut down the supply of food and like hundreds of people died underground. Mm. And then he made these like 24 hour return journeys carrying food, uh, carrying dead bodies out. Like, they're completely different people. They're completely different. There, there's, a, there's a mine boss and there's a mine laborer. But there's a shitload of brutality, like, even by the standards of mining in South Africa, which has an exceptionally brutal history. I mean, we sort of take it as rote, but, like, I spent time in archives, and you guys will know this as well. Like, like the, the dehumanizing, underpaid, just mass-produced black labor and, and like, wreckage that, that the mining industry depended on. That, that, that's also kind of continued through to the present in the way that like the brutality that these miners face from the cops and the authorities, sure, because it's easier to go after the little guy and like go corpse dump a few guys in the West Rand after there's like one of these episodic moral panics about illegal mining, like that mass rape in Kruger's mm. report. Then there's like two weeks of front page and everyone treats it as a ma national crisis. So mm. they get, you know, stamped around. But they're also facing like unimaginable brutality from the people who have seized control of that economy because that's what happens mm. when an economy goes into shadow mm. and when it becomes unregulated and ungoverned then it's just like the threat of violence that basically gives command of the thing. So there's Russian gangsters who move in with their AK-47s like bought from the Lesotho Defense Force and uh, you know, factional fights underground of different mining groups are only allowed to work in different areas. The, it sometimes get over-exaggerated, but there are very credible accounts of human trafficking where someone will get signed up, like some, some guy living in the v a mountain village in Lesotho, someone will come and say, you know, you want to come work in the mines? Like, my, my cousin works in the mines, we've got a job for you, your family gives me some money, they get brought in, and then they get led to the end of a pit, and they say, okay, you've got to climb now. And if they don't climb, the first guy gets shot and kicked down the pit. Like, this happens. Yeah. So there's like... There's a sort of a, 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 metastat a metastasizing violence that happens throughout this industry that's not all from the authorities. It's like, it's like the whole, yeah. the, the, the value of this mineral mm. and the residual value of this mineral and then the collapse of a legal industry that's gonna harvest, like mine it. And even at $2,000 an ounce or whatever, the crazy thing is nobody wants to invest in the South African mining industry for political reasons, because they don't know that they've got land tenure, because they're scared about you know, if like a more radical faction of politicians are gonna to come to power, the day of the mining industry is very standoffish. And so we still have, I think, the biggest proven gold reserves in the world, but nobody wants to invest mm -hmm. here. So it's not profitable to like 
reline a shaft and put an elevator back down that the guys are currently climbing down the bunting. But there's still an enormous amount of gold there that is profitable to mine out if you're a guy with no money and you're going down there with like a pick and a shovel and maybe a jackhammer. Mm -hmm. So then there's like this economy of scale and, and, and of politics mm -hmm. that means that I just see the future of gold mining in South Africa as being one of Zama's Zama's, especially when you factor in the corruption, the rule of law and all of that. And I think that's very dark. Mm -hmm. I think it's very dark. And the people who suffer most are these people who are not criminals. Mm -hmm. They're just men and sometimes women. I mean, the women do a lot of work at the surface, mm. in my experience, like crushing and grinding and getting mercury poison, poisoning. Mm. And then having this kind of criminal apparatus, and then the criminal apparatus, by the way, includes the police who also go shake them down and beat them up and rob them and take their gold. And one, eyes, one of One Eye's favorite moves in Joburg was he had just like corrupt enough of the police force, and then there's like other kingpins, and then he'd say, okay, that guy, go get his gold, so then the police go, blue light, roo, 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 pull up at your house, like, take all the gold, it never gets booked in, and just goes straight to one eye, um, you know? Like the police are just working for him as like an extortion record of their own. Um, and because the economies of Lesotho and Zimbabwe and Mozambique are like, so catastrophic and worsening, I don't see that flow of people mm. kind of lessening at any stage, and then that feeds into this like completely berserk and unhinged but also understandable xenophobic narrative because people living in these communities do see yeah. this incredibly violent criminal infrastructure pegged to gold with mostly foreign bodies working in those shafts. Mm -hmm. And then the weird thing, the dissonant thing, is that that's often the only economy in town. Like, so Vulcan was an extreme case. Like the car dealership shut down when they closed illegal mining. Like, like you know, like like the formal economy was completely dependent on that illegal gold flow. But like somewhere like Kachiso on the West Rand here, like that's I was there after this mass rape story um, that happened last year. There was like a really weird thing where there was like a mm -hmm. film Very shoot. Strange. I don't know what the hell was going on on this like desolate dune in Krugersdorp. Like the most terrifying place. I drove past there. I was like, hell no, I'll never go up that dune. Who's going to take like scantily clad women for a music video? Very fishy. But like a week afterwards, I went there and I was taken to Kukhiso by a Zimbabwean um, gold uh, dealer. And um, there were hundreds of men grinding their pindukas behind the shacks. Mm. There were guys crossing the road at sunset with their bags of gravel. Those are shallower mines. So it's not like the Valcom thing where you have to go underground for like two years. They can do like little few day trips. The whole economy was happening. The next day, the ANC got behind because there was this rising tide of xenophobia and the ANC organized a protest march, which is like, how ridiculous, mm -hmm. like it's your government. And they said, we're marching against some of we're marching against xenophobia. And then you guys saw the headlines, you saw what happened in Krugersdorp. I think several people died, mm -hmm. houses were set alight, mm -hmm. people were beaten up. And there's this like sort of spasm of like ridding the community of this evil Zamazama scourge, but then like they're paying rent, they're buying Amaguinha, they're like renting cars, they're taking local girlfriends and paying them more than the South African guys can. Like this is, this is where the money goes. And so then it comes back. And over and over and over again, if like, if anyone gets fucked up, it's the little guy mm -hmm. and the woman. But I think there's a very structural sort of momentum here where I see this as the future of mining in South Africa, and I think that's very bleak, and I hope I'm wrong. Thanks, Kimon. Um, I'm aware that we're close to time, and I'll ask for an indulgence from our panel as an act of reciprocity, that our audience is given sure. sufficient time to ask the questions, because I know there, there might be many. You guys talk a lot, but it's Sorry. super interesting. Um, absolutely, oh, Doc. I'll come, I'll come back to you. I just want to make some, some, some food for thought, both for the audience and for the panel. Um, there's a lot that's spoken about this absence of the regulatory and policy framework. Um, and I'm sure there are strong opinions about, well, what can that achieve in the face of this very complicated and multifaceted um, contemporary historical problem. Um, there is a policy that's come out in March 2022, and I know, Dr. Munakamwe, uh, you've been part of that process. It's uh, the artisanal and small-scale mining policy. Um, and it's a document that seeks to formalize artisanal mining. It seeks to introduce some definitions, distinctions between small-scale miners, artisanal miners. But maybe importantly, it omits a lot of the people we were talking about tonight, the illegal miners, the Zamazamas, and the question of how to bring those already involved 
in the sector within the remit of a policy environment is an important point I'd like you to reflect on. Um, as well as the onus on other areas that require harmonization with this policy, social development being one of them, right? Um, a policy on its own that's trying to formalize a sector but isn't speaking to the socio-economic, socio-political dynamics attendant to the sector, you know, how far will this go? Um, and then maybe come on to your, in, in your article, there's a one-liner from AA to ZZ, and our audience are clever, so they might figure out what the AA refers to in respect of a mining company, but this ZZ is Zama Zama, and it speaks to this point you make about what is the future uh, and what does it look like. So those are just some food for thought. I think as you answer questions, feel, feel, feel free to bring in the other interjections that you wanted to make in the course of your uh, conversation, but I'll take a first round now. Mm. Um, and we'll, we'll go as the comfort of the panel is. So maybe we can start with... Um, four questions to start, uh, if that's okay with the panel. Uh, and Look, I, I feel like we've spoken so much, we, I, I don't mind mm. sitting here for longer. Well, there it's you go, so this, that's, that's, a, great, uh, that's yeah. a great way forward. I will ask one indulgence from the audience. If you're rising to do a quick introduction as you're comfortable to do, um, and also just to let us know if you're making a comment or asking a question. Uh, the HSF was deliberate in choosing this panel, so we want to know if we have a, a fourth panelist that we, we didn't know we invited. <laughs> so if you're making a comment, we just ask that you keep it relatively brief. If you're making an interjection, having a debate, that's fine. Uh, and if you're asking a question, just who you intend the question to be directed at, or if you'd like the question to go to the panel. Who has got our roving mic is here. So, hands. Perhaps we need to give them some more. See one hand <laughs> in the back. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Kwezi Skoni from the Friedrich Nama Foundation. Um, it's a very simple question to the panel. Um, so South Africa has been our mining industry, there's a discourse that emerged like in the 2010s that it's a sunset industry. Mm. Um, so in your sort of uh, opinions, do you think that there's a parallel or correlated relationship between sort of sunset industries? Uh, well, is it a sunset industry? Probably, you know. And is there a, a parallel relationship between that and the emergence of sort of illicit uh, uh, economies that emerge from that. Thanks. Thanks, Kwezi. That's a, that's a question to the, to the panel. Yep, cool. Anyone else? We'll just keep going if we don't have questions. Titsi, I see your hand. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for an extremely riveting um, conversation. <laughs> I mean, being from Zimbabwe myself, the whole time I was just like, oh my goodness, this is, you know, something that is plaguing, you know, my brothers and sisters in this country. So my question is around the regulatory framework. Um, oh, I didn't introduce myself. Sorry. Let me go back. Uh, my name is Tutsi, uh, and I'm from Invest Africa. And um, so my question is around the regulatory framework. Are there any other countries that we've seen globally that have successfully implemented um, a framework that addresses some of the challenges that you guys um, uh, brought up this evening? Thank you. Thanks, Lutzi. Um, Nicole. going to do another introduction. Um, just to say, in uh, response to, to Keith's observation, um, and, and the fact that there seems to have been a sort of inability to um, insist on sort of locating the, the provenance of the gold um, in contradistinction to, to other minerals, right? Is that, is just, is that just a failure in sentiment of a kind of effective campaigning, um, is it possible to imagine that, as with kind of diamonds and the campaigns against blood diamonds, that one might be able to establish a kind of more effective Function. sentiment yeah. that that insists upon um, locating the provenance of, of gold? Got one 
Um, good evening, I'm Juliet Briggs, I'm from the HSF. Uh, so uh, my, my question to the panel is, I wanted to understand, how does the gold get from being in the iron, uh, being in the ore, in the rock, um, to being refined, and then does it ever enter the formal industry, or does it always remain sort of undocumented gold that then can be moved around. Um, as um, Professor um, Breckenridge said, it can be sent to other countries. Or, or does it actually then at some point enter sort of the formal gold industry and get turned into um, I don't, cougarans and <laughs> um, yeah, gold bars and that type of thing? Thanks, Juliet. So we've got our four to start, and it seems all for our general questions for the panel. So um, let me start with the first question, and uh, feel free, whoever would like to take it and, and whoever would like to respond to it as well. This is the question of is gold mining a sunset industry, and, and what of the future of illicit economies, if anyone would like to take that? I think uh, for me, uh, thank you very much for that uh, particular question. I just want to be a bit of a devil here uh, now. For me, I think um, lithium uh, or cobalt, whatever the transition minerals, are slowly becoming the gold of the day. And I think we might even speculate some movements further north from South Africa. I'm just putting it on the table for us to reflect, particularly in light of xenophobia as well. Because why am I saying this? There are many of these South African companies that are now investing in all these countries that surround them, where lithium cobalt has been found. So perhaps that's going to change the narrative of how South Africa is perceived even within this whole complex, um, you know, political economy of mining. It's no longer that, um, you know, special location or position uh, that used to be where everybody will be rushing to Wenela to what is it? Mzanzi. Mm. Yeah. Egoli. Okay. I wrote some article uh, some years back around all that glitters in Egoli is not gold. So <laughs> I think um, for me, reflecting also on the issue of the um, illicit transparency and trusts. I think there are so many lessons that could be actually, um, you know, drawn from how gold, these precious so-called special minerals, have been um, exploited by the powers that be without benefiting the, um, you know, ordinary people. I think as we move towards all this hype around the new gold, which is lithium, I don't know, we have to vote lithium or cobalt, since they said there are some, sp some limitations to the use of lithium, depending on whether it has been mined by through child labor, but who cares? No one cares. Who cares? <laughs> and that talks to the question of, the fundamental question around the hierarchy. You know, the, the global value chain, I wouldn't get into that because I don't want to take much time. But my question is, who cares about human rights violations in as far as these minerals are concerned as long as capitalism has to sustain itself? Obviously, um, it has to maximize profits by exploiting, like what uh, Keith has mentioned, around how much are women paid, you know? A study in the, in the DRC actually showed that they are paid an average of $8.50 per day. Those are 
women working in the cobalt industry, where there is high exploitation of child labor. The children are paid $2.50. And yet, what happens? They are still working and trying to avoid the police. Who cares at the end of the day um, whether the gold that somebody has been trying to dodge the police finds itself or the, the cobalt and the lithium? Do you think they will even bother to ask as to how did this lithium, the, all these reserves, got to be where they are? But of course, we understand the rhetorics um, that has always been said by these politicians in as far as regulating the sector is concerned. In fact, the mining industry, we have noted recently the gold mafia in Zimbabwe. All along we thought now that perhaps the so-called, they lie that because of the so-called sanctions which do not even exist, um, they're not selling gold, they're not trading in gold. But funny enough, there are always ways in which it has to, you know, they have to sell, not directly through those markets, Tutsi, but obviously there are people who are interfacing with the very same people at the point of production and extraction. Who are they? The buyers, who own the buyers? Who, who do they work for? The political elites. This is why you see that all these, um, these are some of the issues that I came across. All these, um, what do you call them? The raids that they do, they're actually very well managed in such a way that you find that the very same buyer who was at the same space where the ordinary Zamazama has been nabbed, they are working scot-free. How is that so? Hence my question is who cares about child labor and all these principles around uh, we can't um, buy, you know, anything, a product of lithium or gold that has been mined, you know, through this way. Or, you know, we have had cases of um, the bloody diamonds in Congo, but did people stop buying or trading with Congo? Can I jump in there? That's a question. Because yeah. one thing to that, who cares? Like I said cynically, no one cares. I actually think everyone cares. Yeah. Like, like, no one wants to drive an EV that they're doing for climate change reasons and mm -hmm. know that it's, like, from child labor. But there's this, like, really clever trick that these supply chains are able to do, which is to persuade people that they aren't contributing to the problem. I think, like, most people don't want a blood diamond. Most people don't want gold from Zama Zamas. I mean, a few people, maybe a few people do, I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but the point I would, I'm making, But there's yeah, this, there's this infrastructure who cares? that... And it goes back to the question of regulated framework. Mm -hmm. Right on. If really... Uh, I'm concluding now. If really our political leaders cared, do you think by now we couldn't have a regulatory framework in place? So everybody is taking advantage of that lacuna in the policies and the legislations to, you know, kind of further advance their own individual political and socioeconomic interests. If really our governments cared, you know, I mean, government started, I mean, I'm talking about where I was last time. If they really care, obviously, Keith raised something very fundamental, which I was tempted to respond to earlier, around the social security or social development you mm -hmm. actually further. Wouldn't it be fair enough to say, okay, instead of women and children toiling, um, inhaling dust, can we find other means of subsidizing? And we all know who wouldn't be qualifying for that, the migrant woman and the migrant child. So it all goes back to that double criminalization, double vulnerabilities. So those are some of the key questions, which is why you find high presence of migrants in those particular spaces, mm. because they have no alternative they don't have a social grant, they don't have a child grant, they don't have any other means unless if they go to those particular spaces. So hence, for me, the key point here is that this reluctance or you know, kind of 
turning a blind eye towards uh, crafting policies and laws that relate to this particular uh, regulatory framework. It's all because everybody is, who, who is supposed to care? I mean, everyone cares, like everyone here in this room, but those who are in those positions of power, they're mm. actually finding some ways in which they're benefiting at the expense of everyone else. So do you think they would care about having a regulatory framework in place? We worked around that through uh, a research that was uh, commissioned by the Oxfam South Africa. That was in 2017. When the department actually called out for submissions from communities, we went out for consultative dialogues, consultative um, session, you know, you know, engagements with communities. Obviously, there were huge, long lists here. Yeah. What happened last year when they came up with that draft of theirs? They had to make sure they ring fence. They select, they're selective on what to include in those policy framework and what not to include. And we know very well that here in South Africa, the communities and civil society is very highly um, mobilized. So it was so clear that communities would say, no, this doesn't reflect our views. Yes, they were consulted. We made formal submissions to the department, but what came out is something that is to the interest of the powers that be. So these are the issues that we need to put on the table. We have so many big minds in universities in RF, but the government is very selective on who and why, at what point they really want this to happen because we have specialists who could actually quickly come out with some studies and you know, go through that process of policy uh, you know, making. But what, make, what stops them from doing that if uh, the economy is really grounded historically and in contemporary South Africa on the mining sector? So that kind of... Um, uh, I don't know, complacent, I don't know in a way what, what, what's the best way to say it, but it's, it's very difficult because um, to really deal with it, but it also points to the reason why we have, you know, high levels of violence in various ways. Thank you for raising that. I can't stop without talking about that because every role player is now taking advantage of that lacuna, you know? So everybody's to their own benefit. Those who really are genuine and want the regulatory framework so that they can operate and contribute towards tax meaningfully to the economy without facing any barriers, they are now disadvantaged and clubbed together. Hence the sector today, it's called illegal criminalized. I remember last year when I had some debate on television where I was told that, you know what, Janet, uh, we, can't, we can't talk about this. this. These are outright criminals. They belong to prison. Mm -hmm. Finish and clear. And that was a government official. Just to close me to censor my mm -hmm. views around that area. But the, the story of that innocent woman, that innocent child, that innocent man who is trying to earn, earn a living, you know, um, in a very, you know, legal, you know, of course, to them they tell you that we are not, we are not, we are zama zamas. Zama zama means we are trying to earn a living. So they would tell you that we are not criminals. So Thank those are some of the issues that I think would really need to yeah. take into account that it's a deliberate move. Thank Not you, to Doctor. have the reg regulatory framework. I think you've actually, you. in your response, touched on both Tutsis and Nicole's intervention. Prof, I'd like to bring you in if you've got any reflections. Yeah, I'll be super quick. So, sure. um, I don't have a lot of hope for the white, whatever it is, this policy statement, the white paper from mm. the Department of mm. It seems it's pretty clearly about empowering South Africans' control over the, over the people who don't have citizenship. But I think it's mm. going to strengthen already you know, the same problems we already see there. Um, but I also don't think there, I think that this, there's a kind of hopefulness to this regulatory argument that, 
you know, it's going to work in Ghana, it's going to work in Sudan, that's the place where it, but look at Sudan, right? Mm. They had the furthest along the line, this has kind of broken the state completely. This, mm. The former army in Himiti, who was really the representative of the artisanal miners, they're now basically mm. blowing the whole country up. Um, I think it's partly about us being a bit, you know, we need to be a bit more kind of consciously and theoretically pessimistic mm. about what the state can actually manage um, and, wh and, the, and, the co and the world in which we live in, I'm afraid. I don't mean to be, people say this to me all the time, you can't constantly pitch a Jeremiah, you have to be a bit more optimistic and positive. <laughs> I think that's important. Um, but, uh, but uh, let's also be aware that this is a really difficult problem, and it's mostly demographic, right? Mm. The, the 20th century history of South Africa, it's 20-fold increase in population. It's extremely difficult to manage that. And what we're seeing now is exactly the same things are happening on the continent. Very large population growth in all of these areas, no work. Mm. People are going to push for whatever they can to find to do mm. it. So I do think there are things we can do, but I'm afraid from, for me it's mainly about going to the rich countries and saying, unless you d address the welfare issues mm. in these countries where people are desperate and poor and tens of millions, you're also going to face a lot of problems. Mm. They're coming across mm. the Mediterranean for mm. you mm. as mm. well, right? So <laughs> that's my, my main view on this. It's got to be dealt with globally. We can't fix it in Johannesburg or in Valcom. Just on this particular question of provenance, the problem is gold is just designed. Its whole purpose is yeah. about being, it's being hidden. You know, you give somebody a gold bar, they're going to shave a few t tens or hundredths of a gram off it and give it to somebody else. You cannot, you really can't make that work. The World Gold Council keep promising they can do this because what they'd love to do is block off the 50% of gold production that's coming from the artisanal miners. They love to put that in a special container and say only buy from Glencore or Anglo Gold. Of course they mm. want to do that, but it's just, you know, it's not going to happen. Mm. The best example of why not, this refinery that owned by, I hope he's not in the room, that's the Zimbabwean gangster, rapper, the rapper <laughs> refinery here. What did they do? They, took, they bought Krugerrands, and they melted it into it. gold to make it look like it was artisanal because they knew then they would get the VAT refund. You know, it's, it's money. This stuff is money, but it's money in the old school. This is the same thing that, you know, the traders are doing at Rand Merchant Bank, but people are thinking about how to do it physically. It's, and it's because gold is money and they really know what they're doing with it and, it, and where the, the, the arbitrage opportunities are. That's how we need to be thinking about this thing. Gold is the same as an interest rate swap or, you know, some derivative object that you can really find all sorts of tricky ways of managing. And the only way we're going to fix that is if people basically, if the Americans stop being, A, bloody stupid about managing the way they, their debt so that people calm down and they buy American government debt. And also so that, you know, they don't, I mean, I, you know, Putin is a bad guy. He's terrible. I'm very angry with him. Furious. But the big, big mistake was thinking that you could seize... $400 billion worth of dollar-denominated assets without causing a global mm. panic about people's trust in the dollar gold supply. Dollar supply. Sorry, I know that's not what you want to hear, Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, 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 I'm aware of a certain privilege on this panel, which is that I'm not an activist or an academic, and no one ever expects me not Anything to be negative. Say, I can no. just be fucking <laughs> negative. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's also a privilege to sit on a panel with, with uh, subject specialists. Uh, like, mm. I visit... I visit the, the domains that you guys are specialists and, and experts in, and I learn from you. So it's like it's really nice to sit up here with you. Um, on the regulation of it, I feel like you know gold mining is a 19th century activity. Yeah, it is. Mm. And I think that the mining of gold in South Africa, with the current like political and economic frameworks and the depth of the gold, requires a 19th century approach to labour that wouldn't be like tolerable anymore. So I'm genuinely curious what, I, I, I completely hear you that, that there should be a regulatory framework to keep out some of the skeletons who make like this completely violent and insane. But I also don't know, I, maybe I lack the imagination for what a regulatory framework looks like that safely takes artisanal miners mm -hmm. two kilometers underground. And, and by the way, I keep talking about the verticality of this thing, but there's also like a, a, a horizontal dimension where there's only there's these levels that spread for miles and miles and miles. You know, you could walk from one end of Joburg to the other underground, cross-cutting between these different layers, and, and they've all caved in because they haven't been rehabilitated for a long time. And they don't have, the, the, the noxious gases accumulate in them, they flood. 
So there's a huge capital like investment needed to make these places like vaguely safe to work in. So I just don't know what it looks like to safely take artisanal miners into that space where any government regulatory agency be like, cool, like we can get behind this. Um, and then I, I think it's very possible. Let me interject. Well, that's I think, fantastic. I think um, for me, it's a matter of um, harnessing now we have new technology. And now it takes me right to the work that we do at West Mining Institute. Uh, we actually are looking, uh, we have some very broad research that looks into, um, uh, we term it DJ mining, how to exploit the um, contemporary or, you know, digital innovation for the benefit of those who want to go underground, but also involved in the sector. Um, yes, we understand these health and safety issues. So if our research is to uh, assist only big mining corporates, because that research obviously is going to benefit. I'm sure you, they're funding it, right? Yes, they're funding, but yeah. why doesn't it also have to benefit the, mm. the ordinary small-scale players? Once regulated, so the point is... Whatever. I mean, I like, I like that vision well, listen, of the, I like listen, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be <laughs> optimistic now. I, I, yes. As you must. I, yes. Yeah. Why should we only uh, focus everything around, you know, large scale mining? For me, whatever study that I would prioritize should, at the end of the day, benefit the ordinary small miner on the ground, who is not mining for the sake of making huge profits or uh, buying all these mansions and whatever, mm. but who is trying to earn a living, make a living through, you know, whatever. <laughs> I completely agree with you. That would be fantastic. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I just of don't course. know if anyone's going to do it. <laughs> but know? I'm just thinking around. That's very thought provocative. Your question that how the how the kind of framework that we need to rethink it has to whatever we are doing for the big mining companies. Let me close it this way. Should apply to small scale miners because for me there's nothing that is called illegal mining. Artisanal small scale mining, mm. it only becomes illegal because of the kind of mineral that is being mined. If I'm mining clay, nobody cares, but yet clay is very important. We all can see what is what everything that has been made by clay here. I want to make so two quick points. Can I quickly interrupt you? <laughs> so, so quickly, I'll be very super quick. The first is there is this thing called the Dog Dodd Frank Act. So it's just an act, the US Congress Act, that says mm. we're going to track the provenance of all these minerals, but not cobalt and not gold, mm -hmm. right? They're supposed to gold too. Mm -hmm. So the truth is, everybody wants to be kind. Everybody wants to care. The problem is caring isn't going to help us manage this problem. The honest truth. It doesn't matter really what the stake. These problems are immense. And, and in, in, in many ways, come on, the, the, the difficulty of gold mining is the thing that protects us. You can't just dig, go outside in the parking lot and dig for gold in South <laughs> Africa. You've got to go down, and it's extremely dangerous. So, so in many ways, we're protected from this big problem that is afflicting the continent. But we shouldn't sit here and say, you know, we're going to fix it if we, if we design a regulatory framework that applies to Velcom. Because those guys are coming. You know, if they'll come across the border because they are desperate. And we have to have a plan that fixes their economies. Sorry. Thank you. I don't, okay. yeah. I, don't want to lose the, I don't want to lose the, the last question that we had from Juliet. And Kimon, I know in your article, you do a bit of this yeah. tracking for us, this okay. route to market. How does something in a piece of rock end up? If I could ask you very quickly to just... Oh, yeah. super quickly. It gets yeah, laundered okay. into, li into licit supply chains, is my understanding, with very, very sophisticated networks of front companies that efface the source of the gold. Uh, it's cr uh, all the the huge gold shops that you see everywhere. I've always wondered, like, surely yeah, not that many people are selling their no. second-hand watches. Like, I'm sure a few They're for VAT registration. They don't <laughs> actually buy and sell gold. 
and and so and so there's like there, there's 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 some little loopholes, and there's white collar businessmen who are very adept at buying in gold. And uh, Ama Bungane obtained a confidential SARS investigation. You mentioned rapid trading, but two companies alone, just through laundering gold and melting down Krugerrands to export them and get this VAT refund, which is insane. That that's like a financially lucrative thing to do. Just two of them claimed VAT refunds. Eight billion rand or eight billion dollars. <laughs> it was half a percent of South Africa's entire yeah. tax budget for that uh. year. So think of all the taxes that all of us pay and every corporation pays, and then one two hundredth of that, two companies was like, mm, like actually- Let's go long, if actually, I'm gonna we'll try take, for the song. Yeah. We'll <laughs> take that back, because we've been, we've been selling all of the secondhand gold, but it's all Zama Zama gold. Which like, I'm also like, respect criminals, like well, <laughs> well played. So that's if a good place to- You no, can take one two hundredth of the revenue. Um, I can see hands up for another no, round of question already. No, but the big Zama Zama are the big mining companies. Can we agree? Totally, I mean, they pioneered <laughs> no, no, it. No, I don't agree <laughs> either. Illegal. This, yeah, this I think like they inspired them. I saw one hand. Do we, have, do we have more hands for the next round? Here we go, here we go. My questions, hint, hint, <laughs> panelists. <laughs> Let's try and tone it down with our answers, a thousand arches. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Mpomukaleng. I'm from one of the banks. I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> because I might ask something and then tomorrow you will close your bank accounts. I don't oh. want that. I have one point, I wanted to say 1.5. It's been a long day. I've been typing one and a half questions. The first question, and you touched on it, I wanted to touch on financial crime. That's obviously because I work for a bank. And you touched on it. Tax evasion is actually a financial crime, and basically that is what, what those two gold companies were doing. But apart from financial crime money laundering, my interest is also around terrorist financing. 100% mm. I agree with you that when these people take up these roles, these zamazamas take up these roles, more often than not it's because of desperation. But have we done in-depth investigation to try and understand who are the people at the top of the value chain and mm. where is the money going? Are we 100% sure, if we've done our investigations, that this money is not going to terrorist organizations? You mentioned uh, Mozambique, and I think that's one of the stuff that you've researched. And we've heard now, and we've seen also throughout the media, that Mozambique also is a stronghold for terrorist organizations. So has there been any in-depth investigation to make sure that whatever we get here is not, funnel is not funneled of funding this terrorist organization. Now to my half question, which I will divide into <laughs> quarters. <laughs> yeah, they talk a lot, so I need to squeeze everything in. Um, the first quarter is, are we in this Zama Zama situation because the predecessors or the pre-owners of the mines did not close them off thoroughly? Mm. Mm, mm, mm. And I'm making an inference. I'm from the Northern Cape Kimberley. I don't know if I've lost my colored accent, but most people when I speak, they say, but you, you look black, are you colored? Because I have a colored accent. And in Kimberley, we have this big hole mm. right there. It, it, it's not hidden. It's not in Kakamas. It's not in Khrikwastad. It's right in the middle of the CBD. Mm. Five meters from that big hole is the taxi rink that my grandmother uses almost every day. So that hole is growing on a daily basis to a point where they've tried to close it sure. off. But because we know the taxi drivers are also a phenomena in South Africa, they don't listen to anyone, they still pass through that section mm. that has been closed off. Mm. So are we in this situation because what the mining companies did, they came, they took whatever that they wanted to do, and they left the nonsense behind for us to suffer, and they didn't clean it out properly. My other question, the last one, I'm gonna try and bundle it up, relates to what you said, Kimon, that yeah, but, and, and I'm paraphrasing largely, you can correct me when you answer. Uh, you said, but what are these people doing wrong? It's not like they're not contributing towards the economy. They're buying, and I think I read your article, 80 buckets of KFC and, and things like that. So, so we really need to understand. We, we don't want to paint this picture that we are allowing them to do what they're doing because seemingly they're contributing towards the, the fiscus of the country. 
we all pay VAT. When you go buy KFC, you pay VAT. But in addition to paying VAT, there's an individual income tax that you are paying. <laughs> you know about this when you get your pay slip if you're working. That's the element that they are not paying for. And that's why I am pro, we need to regulate this so that we can get each and everything that is due from the minerals and the land of this country. Linking it up to, I don't want money leaving this country and funding terrorist organizations just because they contribute towards one KFC in one isolated region. And then, uh, <laughs> Dr. Before, Jeanette. I think we've <laughs> got two and, a, two and a half questions yes. now. Cool. Can we close <laughs> it off there? Good. Cool. Um, do we have any more hands? I see one hand. Yeah. David, uh, uh, just uh, in sort of developed a kind of hypothesis now that, um, you know, from just attending this because I've been, you know, following this kind of narrative or, you know, what's the developments around the Zama Zamas and there's been a lot of kind of heat around the issue that's been generated quite recently and I'm just, uh, so now, but the, the kind of impression that I'm getting is that in many ways, the, 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 that economy doesn't actually directly threaten existing economic interests in South Africa. And I'm, you know, that's a very kind of crude gloss on the way I'm kind of understanding this issue now. And so, and so I'm just trying to understand because, you know, I'm kind of interested in crime and when does crime become important? When does it kind of matter and, mm, mm. and, and that kind of thing? And, and so, yeah. so, but I, I have a sense that it isn't really that this form of illegality, or whether it's illegality or not, is obviously something that's disputed, but, but is it in fact itself a concern? It's more seems to be that the, the, the kind of xenophobic sentiment mm. in South Africa has picked up on this issue as being, um, you know, a critical kind of threat to the survival of the country or something, you know. and, and and in some ways, the, 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 the presentation of this kind of economy as a threat to South Africa is, 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 is driven more by, by, by the kind of xenophobic sentiment mm. than by anything mm. else. Mm. I wondered if that's a reasonable observation to make or if it's just, uh, you know, what is driving this, this kind of sense of this kind of threatening our economy or our, our country? Thank you so much, David. You are so kind. <laughs> Do we have any more? I'll take, I see one more. We can take maybe two last questions before we sort of go eat. Hi there. I'm Victoria. Um, there's so much in my head about the difference, you know, the different approaches and the different um, problems that we've got here. And one of the things that really strikes me is that we're trying to balance all sorts of constitutional rights. We've got, mm. you know, the, the, the people, where are the people from? Where are the miners from? Where are the off takers from? What are the different rights at play here? Who are the different regulatory kind of bodies who are responsible for this? We've got home affairs, we've got DMRE, we've got um, the, the law enforcement. Mm. Um, I'm a property owner, I'm a lawyer, I've got a lot of exposure to Zamazamas, to problems with immigration. Um, and I guess in, when we're talking about a regulatory framework, we have a regulatory environment in which all mining happens in South Africa. Mineral rights are owned by the state. People are supposed to apply to the, to, to the DMRE for the right to mine those minerals. Mm. Those rights come with certain responsibilities, which include safety, which include um, land owner, property owner's rights, which include the rights of employees or workers to a safe working environment. And I don't know that a different regulatory or parallel regulatory framework gets the miners safely underground. I love the idea that there are new technologies, but what you said, um, Doctor, is that there's such a lacuna, there is such a lack of will at all levels, and possibly that's where so many of the vested interests in the end product of this artisanal mining are going, 
But how do we get, that seems to me to, while there is this lacuna, while there is this absolute lack of interest, whether it's because these are foreign workers, whether that's because there's a lot of money, how do we get that working? Because we can't scrap that system. We can't have a formal system and an informal system working together. So my question is, how do we, how do we get the, the, the institutions that are supposed to take responsibility for this to take responsibility for it? Because that's you know really the where, it, yeah. where it comes from. Home affairs, DMRE, safety and security. How do we do that? We can't generate a parallel system. So that's, where, that's my conclusion. Thank you. Oh. Do we have a last interjection or comment okay. before we take it to the panel? See one last one. Hi. Uh, so my name is Justin. Uh, it doesn't matter what I do. I'm a student. Um, so I suppose my question ties to, I think, Victoria, what she was just speaking about. Um, and this is a question specifically for Kiman. I was interested in your uh, experience of to what extent does the government actually know about and is complicit in this kind of non-regulation? Because it's from your experience and your discussion about what's going on, it seems like a very elaborate process. There's a whole bunch of logistics that are involved and it seems extremely unlikely that the government does not know about this. And so I suppose the question is, in your own experience, to what extent have government officials almost been complicit in the non-regulation and the lack of interest in regulating this kind of industry? Thanks, Justin. Um, Kimar, we'll remind you this is being live streamed, uh, so your free legal advice is. Uh, <laughs> I forgot um, about that. Maybe, oh uh, my goodness. Maybe we can start uh, just going back to um, and impose questions. I don't know how much of you've been following the gold, but following the illicit financial flows is a different question. Um, and maybe tying that together with accountability, and I think that's a really important question of the mine owners themselves, and these are abandoned mines, mm. but mm. the dereliction and you know, the, the state that they're left in. Um, I'll, I'll open that to the panel at large, just our, our thoughts in respect of that. Can I start super quickly, because I was paraphrased slightly inaccurately. <laughs> um, Go ahead. <laughs> so, 100% um, an illicit gold economy is bad in very many ways, including tax evasion and all these things. I want to be very clear about that. So I just wanted to clarify where I'm coming from, from the perspective of a community where gold, illicit gold mining becomes a major pillar of the economy. I think from that, someone in that community, I think they have like this kind of ambivalent relationship with it. And I think that's part of why we see these cycles of like, we're going to chase all the Zamas out, but then they come back in because they're keeping the tuck shops going. So that's, that's very much what I'm seeing too. It's not a victimless crime financially. It's, it's tied into high level organized crime and maybe mm. you guys can talk more about that, but like you're spot on. I think there are links to terrorists and stuff like that. Like we, we know this because gold is such a untraceable, industry meltdownable kind of thing. That's what people like it for. Um, so I just wanted to clear that. <laughs> and then there was another, the question of the open minds, like of course, like, so, so like sometimes people like want to know what my take is. Am I pro? Am I anti? And, and I sometimes get stuck on these kind of panels because I'm just like, I just want to understand why this thing happened. And when I look at the Zama thing that we've got, to me it just looks like, like if you had to guess what would happen, if you over decades brought millions of people from across Africa to work in these mines, and you dug them really deep, and then you shut them down, but you didn't close them properly, and you left gold in the bottom, like, let's like guess what might happen. Like I just think this is a completely logical outcome. Mm -hmm. and, and part of what I try and do as a journalist is like just look at that in its kind of moral ambiguities. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the numbers of the shafts that were left open, but Valcom had 50 and they didn't close any of them properly. You know, that's 50 shafts, plus ventilation channels, plus uh, ducts for cabling. There's like hundreds of entry points into this like interconnected tunnel network with literal money down there for anyone risky, like risk hungry enough to go and get it. Of course they're gonna go get it. And 
companies could have spent way more money doing proper rehab. By the way, all these mine dumps that you see around Joburg, they blow radioactive waste across all the townships that are situated downwind, which is an apartheid town planning kind of thing as well. Like Valcom, one instance, they had the mine dumps, they situated Valcom in a way where the prevailing winds would like blow away from Valcom. They're like, where should we put the black township? Like, oh my God, I guess we should put it there. So like, the, the environmental and sort of uh, rehabilitation legacy of the mining companies, I think is appalling and an absolutely like central driver of this economy among all these other drivers. Mm. Uh, I guess that's my answer to those questions. Thanks, Kimon. Um, yeah. Any other reflections? Okay. I, I do want to move to David's point because I, I think that was an interesting question about the drivers of sentiment and what's really behind what we're, we're seeing dominating headlines, if I can call it, or... Um, you had more to say to that question okay. as well, though. Huh? Did you have more to say to that question? Uh, Victoria. Oh, okay, sure, sure. So, I think yep, for ahead. me, um, kids, I totally hear you uh, before I even get back to... Okay. Uh, about the question around, uh, do we really need a police framework? Um, uh, what is it? What's are the... For me, I still maintain that I think we really need this regulated mm -hmm. framework in place. How do you define illegality in the absence of a um, police framework? Let me just ask, because for me, the laws, yes, somebody said there are laws and whatever that have to guide, that provide guidelines. Those laws, let me be honest and be frank, are from my review of those particular laws. They were actually crafted around big mining, you know, corporate mining. Nothing for ASM, this summer, Zama, it's an emerging sector on its own. And Victoria, I must say thanks for that uh, thought-provoking question, but at the same time, um, I will share maybe if I can get some time because I don't want to take people um, more of your time now there is an intricate relationship between informal and formal. And the reality is that this is what we are living right now. You know, if we, are, we think there is what, uh, what is happening in the abandoned mines is completely detached from mm. what's happening in the formal mines, then that's not, um, we need to go back to the drawing table. I think uh, in his opening remarks, um, Kiman is like even shocked. <laughs> he raised uh, something very fundamental to say, who takes food down? Yeah. Where does the mercury come from? Where all this, for, you know, if you look at the labor process itself, you would actually see an intricate, strong linkages between these two. They're not parallel. They're actually one part of a continuum. I don't even know which one is on zero or minus, which one begins from minus one, or, but they feed into each other. It's really a very sophisticated uh, industry that um, would need some time to really get to the bottom of it. And that takes me quickly to the question from Komi, I think from the bank. I totally understand why you're raising this very <laughs> important concerns. Uh, but for me, I think uh, the moment we bring in the picture of terrorism, we completely miss it around the conversation that I think we are trying to push here around the regulatory framework. Terrorism comes through because of that negligence that I highlighted earlier, that if the powers that be are really serious about what we need to do, then they shouldn't scapegoat. Obviously, when anyone wants to demonize me, they will have to look for a word, you know, what we call labeling, stigmatization. I don't know, my, my dear pan fellow panelists, when you went to the sites, did you see anyone who looked like a potential terrorist? <laughs> no, they thought I was. <laughs> that, wasn't what the, that wasn't the question. No. You, eh? It's I'm, not really the question. No, 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 no. My question, yeah. now let me get the yeah. kids, what I'm trying to say. The very same terrorism, it still goes back to the big giants. The people who are exploiting, these people are getting exploited. 
That's the case I'm trying to make. Mm. Uh, Kiman, you made very important observations and remarks earlier also around what happens underground. We can't run away from human trafficking. Those people who would spend two years underground, you won't be surprised that perhaps they were human trafficked. We can't run away from um, human rights issues that are very fundamental uh, simply because we also want to address uh, and, uh, some violations that are taking place. It goes without saying, and I'm not apologetic about it, as a feminist um, activist scholar, I wouldn't condone any gender-based violence that happens in those spaces. But why is it happening? It's happening because the sector is just a, you know, nobody's land. You come and do whatever, like says the fair, you can come and rape a child living in those spaces or women and just, uh, you know, with impunity, get away with it. So we are not trying to condone criminality or anything that is by law illegal. I think we need to be very clear and ground that uh, I would want to say it upfront. We can't also really claim that there are no human rights violations that are perpetuated by those that we are trying to, you know, perhaps advance or fight for their rights. I think Kiman mm -hmm. said it. Uh, very well, that we, there are various different role players who are coming in for various reasons. And by so doing, we can't completely abandon the whole sector simply because of, um, simply because of a few rotten eggs, a few rotten tomatoes. I think even in the Bible, those who follow the Bible, they said in Gomorrah, if there's still one person that can make me serve. Let me do that. So I'll leave it there. So honestly, we still need this framework in place because everybody's taking advantage. Uh, human rights violations with impunity, without accountability at the end of the day. So let's revisit that framework. I know it might sound like an abstract idea, but for the people that are actually uh, spending their time in those spaces, this would mean a lot because it talks about recognition. The first thing for you to be covered by the law is to be recognized that whatever you're doing mm. is actually classified as work. It goes back to those debates around domestic work, recognition, sex work, all those kind of issues. I don't want to bring those into the, uh, the conversation, but everyone who is vulnerable, obviously, there'll be s nobody would care and obviously, they'll be further demonized even by us academics. I was actually called as a Mazama, even right now I'm called Dr. Zama there, simply because of the work that I was trying to do. Are you safe there? What kind of, it's like I'm actually spending much of my time with these dodgy people. And yet. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, thank you. Prof. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't disagree with that. I think the, the framework is definitely better than no framework. I worry specifically, and I, I think it's a subject for another panel, <laughs> I think it's going to heighten the wording as, as it is really, I mean, I've never seen in, in a framework things that are aimed specifically at South Africans as citizens in order to deny the other people who are participating mm. in that economy any, any recognition. So, Janet, let's have that discussion another night. I think the big the offshoring issue and the, you know, I think everybody should be saying to the Chinese and the Americans, let's police um, dark spots, offshore, you know, the Cayman mm. Islands, the places where people share, put money illegally and start with Dubai. I mean, mm. obviously, that's where mm. all of this money is going. Mm. Dubai should be under much more pressure than it is. Not so much, I don't think we can say, perhaps we can, but, you know, you can't sh sell gold in Dubai, but certainly if you deposit it in a bank account in Dubai, it should be flagged immediately as suspicious by all other banks, and the banks can, can police and regulate each other. They do it all the time. Uh, I, I, you know, I just worry that this swift Ukraine thing has turned that into a really risky area, but I still, I, it's, it's where I would put my, if I was going to devote my life to a single area of policing and regulation, it would be that. The, I mean, obviously, the police force has got to do its job. And that's a question for you, Kimon. I mean, one eye is in jail, actually. We mm. need to admit this. We need to acknowledge. They did prosecute him. They did successfully put him in prison. Mm. That's, that, to me, is really interesting, that all the things you say about him having basically the powers, the levers, the, the, you know, almost all the whole economy, they still 
they still put him in prison. So I, I don't want to sound too hopeful, but isn't there something there that t- says to us that if we really want to back something in South Africa, we've got to repair the police force. It has to do its job. We spend, you know, whatever it is, 11, 12% of the budget on it. It's got to do a better job than it does. And, it, it, and nothing's going to work unless we get the cops to actually prosecute so people. I'll Go. Sp- I'll speak to why yeah. one is in jail. <laughs> one is in jail because of a private security investigator employed by the large mining Okay, that's there. very interesting. But you didn't put that in that paper. I mean, in your... In, uh, because I have off the record sources. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, 80% of that story was sourced by people That's very be named. interesting. Okay, um, it's pretty sad. So the entire case against one eye was built by a private investigative force. Um, so to the question hmm. of did the government, does the government know, I'll speak to specifics. I'll speak to Valcom. Um, a police reservist I hung out with their estimated 70% of the police force were in the pocket of one eye. And I was like, he's probably exaggerating. But then I spoke to some senior detectives and they sort of laughed and they're like, you know, it's probably higher. Hmm. Um, That's a the way that one eye was caught, firstly, I think he was only, there was only enough political to will to go after, over him because he, he kind of went a bit before and started murdering so many people. Yeah, okay. And so then there was this, yeah. there was this thing where, where these private Harmony Gold investigators could go to the provincial command and say, we need a special operation. Mm. They brought in 50 cops from Bloemfontein and they stationed them there for like two years. I think they're still there. It's called Operation Knockout. The logo's a fist. They're like, we're going to knock them out. Because they couldn't rely on any cops, because as soon as they did any operation, like, word would leak out. Um, so he is in jail. I don't think he would be in jail. He, he certainly wouldn't be in jail if it wasn't for this private investigative capacity. And he wouldn't be in jail if he hadn't killed so many people and there was such a case to make. Um, now, it's not just police who knew about it. So when we talk, like, who's the government? It's an abstract term. But a story that got cut from the magazines, um, the New Yorker is very fastidious about fact-checking. Um, and this one killed me that I had to go out. The mayor who was in charge at the time of the ESCOM deal, his name was Spielman, a um, bit of a dodgy dude. Um, when he was inaugurated, Spielman received the mayoral chain of Valcom, <laughs> which was forged with the establishment of this town, which was this grand statement by the Anglo-American corporations, we're gonna build the perfect gold mining company town. Spare no cost, except for the black people, but we're gonna build this incredible town. We're gonna build this lavish civic center, and we're gonna show the world, and it was, this was two years before the National Party won the 1948 election, two years afterwards, I think, basically at the same time. So it became like the showpiece of the white Afrikaner nationalist project. We're gonna lure people to this barren free state by giving them such awesome jobs, we're gonna build polo lawns, we're gonna build swimming pools, and to commemorate the town, they forged this chain with like, it was like something out of Tolkien, you know, it was like this like mythical chain with like gold from each of the founding mines in these discs, it was beautiful. It was never seen again after Spielman's <laughs> inauguration. <laughs> its value was approximately the, the same amount of money that one I told me that he paid for the ESCOM bill. Ah, there you are. But I was never able to like really fact check this and you know, so it's like maybe, maybe a little bit conspiratorial. But I will say that I got very strong on the record um, interviews, which because we didn't use the anecdote and because of like trying to cut things for space, like one I used to arrive at the city center and go to meetings in the mayor's office with his own bodyguards. Mm. So the government knew everything. And I guess I'll leave it there. <laughs> thank you, Kimon, <laughs> and thank you to the panel. Nicole, I think for all accounts, there's a, a need for maybe a second round table at some point. But um, if I can, I want to, we're happy to close off. Questions? Sure. Okay, really fascinating, as I said, for the for the um, different perspectives and the thoughtfulness of of responses. Tonight, it seemed to me, was not necessarily about finding answers, but about mm. um, understanding, trying to understand 
the complexity um, of, um, of a subject. Um, Dr. Professor Breckenridge used the phrase immense challenge. Um, Dr. Munak Kamwe, you, s you challenged us to think about not of mining not just as a s on a spectrum of legal versus illegal, but to think about legal legality versus artisanal. And even within that, our zamazamas are on a spectrum. Mm. These are really complex issues, but it is so important for us to at least start thinking about them, because this is but one of the myriad of socio-economic challenges mm. we face in South Africa. And as a society, we tend to put off uh, looking for solutions and put off and put off until something explodes. And then the danger is that a short, short termism or popularism or a reactive measure seems to be the only thing that we have left. And so uh, while tonight wasn't necessarily about <laughs> answers and an answer to a regulatory yeah. framework yeah. and I, I do hope that we have a second round table mm. um, and I'm so glad that the HSF was able to start shedding a light on this and, 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 and raising an unpalatable reality. Mm. This is what um, civil society does. We, are, we exist in South Africa in a vibrant civil society which is unafraid to uh, shed light on uh, unpalatable truths uh, and re uh, talk about unpopular causes. We at the HSF are part of this ecosystem. And so you will be aware, if you've been following us, as Nicole has said, you will have been aware of the uh, victimization and harassment that we have been going through you would have been aware of the um, mis campaigns of misinformation, the intimidation of our staff, and the real um, misogyny leveled against our very brave executive director. I take heart from your attendance here tonight and I read into your attendance. Um, uh, a sign of, of support for us. So I'd like to say um, I'm very grateful, not just to the richness of the panelists here tonight and Chimera as facilitator, but also from, from your being here. I also would like to pay a special tribute. We, we do have any friends of the foundation who, sh who support us financially as well as um, uh, not, um, um, through, you know, morally and through other other means, but I'd also like to spare, pay a special um, sign of gratitude to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, the FNF, uh, who um, have long supported our round tables, uh, and you're a great supporter, thank you. Finally, I want to um, thank our HSF staff who have put together this function, and you don't necessarily see all of them. They're the ones who are at the front line, as I say, of this uh, misinformation campaign, and so Nasima, I'm not sure where she is, and Chris, uh, and Ezekiel, and Devashni, and Sophia, and Juliet, uh, thank you for, for your hard work. Thank you to all of you for coming tonight, uh, and I wish you a good night. Thank you. Thank you.